book three chapter three of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter three augustus caesar phil early found the home of the camerons the most charming spot in town as he sat in the old-fashioned parlor beside margaret his brain seethed with plans for building a hotel on a large scale on the other side of the square and restoring her home intact the cameron homestead was a large brick building with an ample porch looking out directly on the courthouse square standing in the middle of a lawn full of trees flowers shrubbery and a wilderness of evergreen boxwood planted fifty years before it was located on the farm from which it had always derived its support the farm extended up into the village itself with the great barn easily seen from the street phil was charmed with the doctor's genial personality he often found the father a decidedly easier person to get along with than his handsome daughter the rev hugh mcalpin was a daily caller and margaret had a tantalizing way of showing her deference to his opinions phil hated this preacher from the moment he laid eyes on him his pugnacious piety he might have endured but for the fact that he was good-looking and eloquent when he rose in the pulpit in all his sacred dignity fixed his eyes on margaret and began in tenderly modulated voice to tell about the love of god phil clenched his fist he didn't care to join the presbyterian church but he quietly made up his mind that if it came to the worst and she asked him he would join anything what made him furious was the air of assurance with which the young divine carried himself about margaret as if he had but to say the word and it would be fixed as by a decree issued from before the foundations of the world he was pleased and surprised to find that his being a yankee made no difference in his standing or welcome the people seemed unconscious of the part his father played at washington stoneman's confiscation bill had not yet been discussed in congress and the promise of land to the negroes was universally regarded as a hoax of the league to win their followers the old commoner was not an orator hence his name was scarcely known in the south the southern people could not conceive of a great leader except one who expressed his power through the megaphone of oratory they held charles sumner chiefly responsible for reconstruction the fact that phil was a yankee who had no axe to grind in the south caused the people to appeal to him in a pathetic way that touched his heart he had not been in town two weeks before he was on good terms with every youngster had the entree to every home and ben had taken him protesting vehemently to see every pretty girl there he found that in spite of war and poverty troubles present and troubles to come the young southern woman was the divinity that claimed and received the chief worship of man the tremendous earnestness with which these youngsters pursued the work of courting all of them so poor they scarcely had enough to eat amazed and alarmed him beyond measure he found in several cases as many as four making a dead set for one girl as if heaven and earth depended on the outcome while the girl seemed to receive it all as a matter of course her just tribute every instinct of his quiet reserved nature revolted at any such attempt to rush his cause with margaret and yet it made the cold chills run down his spine to see that presbyterian preacher drive his buggy up to the hotel take her to ride and stay three hours he knew where they had gone to lover's leap and along the beautiful road which led to the north carolina line he knew the way margaret had showed him this road was the way of romance every farmhouse cabin and shady nook along its beaten track could tell its tale of lovers fleeing from the north to find happiness in the haven of matrimony across the line in south carolina everything seemed to favor marriage in this climate the state required no license a legal marriage could be celebrated anywhere at any time by a minister in the presence of two witnesses with or without the consent of parent or guardian marriage was the easiest thing in the state divorce the one thing impossible death alone could grant divorce he was now past all reason in love he followed the movement of margaret's queenly figure with pathetic abandonment beneath her beautiful manners he swore with a shiver that she was laughing at him 
now and then he caught a funny expression about her eyes as if she were consumed with a sly sense of humor in her love affairs what he felt to be his manliest traits his reserve dignity and moral earnestness she must think cold and slow beside the dash fire and assurance of these southerners he could tell by the way she encouraged the preacher before his eyes that she was criticizing and daring him to let go for once instead of doing it he sank back appalled at the prospect and let the preacher carry her off again he sought solace in dr cameron who was utterly oblivious of his daughter's love affairs phil was constantly amazed at the variety of his knowledge the genuineness of his culture his modesty and the note of youth and cheer with which he still pursued the study of medicine his company was refreshing for its own sake the slender graceful figure ruddy face with piercing dark brown eyes in startling contrast to his snow-white hair and beard had for phil a perpetual charm he never tired listening to his talk and noting the peculiar grace and dignity with which he carried himself unconscious of the commanding look of his brilliant eyes i hear that you have used hypnotism in your practice doctor phil said to him one day as he watched with fascination the changing play of his mobile features oh yes used it for years southern doctors have always been pioneers in the science of medicine dr crawford long of georgia you know was the first practitioner in america to apply anesthesia to surgery but where did you run up against hypnotism i thought this a new thing under the sun the doctor laughed it's not a home industry exactly i became interested in it in edinburgh while a medical student and pursued it with increased interest in paris did you study medicine abroad phil asked in surprise yes i was poor but i managed to raise and to borrow enough to take three years on the other side i put all i had and all my credit in it i've never regretted the sacrifice the more i saw of the great world the better i liked my own world i've given these farmers and their families the best god gave to me do you find much use for your powers of hypnosis phil asked only in an experimental way naturally i am endowed with this gift especially over certain classes who are easily the subjects of extreme fear i owned a rascally slave named gus whom i used to watch stealing suddenly confronting him i've thrown him into unconsciousness with a steady gaze of the eye until he would drop on his face trembling like a leaf unable to speak until i allowed him how do you account for such powers i don't account for them at all they belong to the world of spiritual phenomenon of which we know so little and yet which touch our material lives at a thousand points every day how do we account for sleep and dreams or second sight or the daydreams which we call visions phil was silent and the doctor went on dreamily the day my boy richard was killed at gettysburg i saw him lying dead in a field near a house i saw some soldiers bury him in the corner of that field and then an old man go to the grave dig up his body cart it away into the woods and throw it into a ditch i saw it before i heard of the battle or knew that he was in it he was reported killed and his body has never been found it is the one unspeakable horror of the war to me i'll never get over it how very strange exclaimed phil and yet the war was nothing my boy to the horrors i feel clutching the throat of the south today i'm glad you and your father are down here your disinterested view of things may help us at washington when we need it most the south seems to have no friend at court your younger men i find are hopeful doctor said phil yes the young never see danger until it's time to die i'm not a pessimist but i was happier in jail scores of my old friends have given up in despair and died delicate and cultured women are living on cow peas cornbread and molasses and of such quality they would not have fed it to a slave children go to bed hungry droves of brutal negroes roam at large stealing murdering and threatening blacker crimes we are under the heel of petty military tyrants few of whom ever smelled gunpowder in a battle 
at the approaching election not a decent white man in this country can take the infamous test oath i am disenfranchised because i gave a cup of water to the lips of one of my dying boys on the battlefield my slaves are all voters there will be a negro majority of more than one hundred thousand in this state desperados are here teaching these negroes insolence and crime in their secret societies the future is a nightmare you have my sympathy sir said phil warmly extending his hand these reconstruction acts conceived in sin and brought forth in iniquity can bring only shame and disgrace until the last trace of them is wiped from our laws i hope it will not be necessary to do it in blood the doctor was deeply touched he could not be mistaken in the genuineness of any man's feeling he never dreamed this earnest straightforward yankee youngster was in love with margaret and it would have made no difference in the accuracy of his judgment your sentiments do you honor sir he said with grave courtesy and you honor us and our town with your presence and friendship as phil hurried home in a warm glow of sympathy for the people whose hospitality had made him their friend and champion he encountered a negro trooper standing on the corner watching the cameron house with furtive glance instinctively he stopped surveyed the man from head to foot and asked what's the trouble none of your business the negro answered slouching across to the opposite side of the street phil watched him with disgust he had a short heavy-set neck of the lower order of animals his skin was coal-black his lips so thick they curled both ways up and down with crooked blood marks across them his nose was flat and its enormous nostrils seemed in perpetual dilation the sinister bead eyes with brown splotches in their whites were set wide apart and gleamed ape-like under his scant brows his enormous cheekbones and jaws seemed to protrude beyond the ears and almost hide them that we should send our soldiers here to flaunt our uniform in the faces of these people he exclaimed with bitterness he met ben hurrying home from a visit to elsie the two young soldiers whose prejudices had melted in the white heat of battle had become fast friends phil laughed and winked i'll meet you tonight around the family altar when he reached home ben saw slouching in front of the house walking back and forth and glancing furtively behind him the negro trooper whom his friend had passed he walked quickly in front of him and blinking his eyes rapidly said didn't i tell you gus not to let me catch you hanging around the house again the negro drew himself up pulling his blue uniform into position as his body stretched out of its habitual slouch and answered my name ain't gus ben gave a quick little chuckle and leaned back against the palings his hand resting on one that was loose he glanced at the negro carelessly and said well augustus caesar i give your majesty thirty seconds to move off the block gus's first impulse was to run but remembering himself he threw back his shoulders and said i reckon the street's free yes and so is kindling wood quick as a flash of lightning the paling suddenly left the fence and broke three times in such bewildering rapidity on the negro's head he forgot everything he ever knew or thought he knew save one thing the way to run he didn't fly but he made remarkable use of the facilities with which he had been endowed ben watched him disappear toward the camp he picked up the pieces of paling pulled a strand of black wool from a splinter looked at it curiously and said a sprig of his majesty's hair i'll doubtless remember him without it end of book three chapter three Book Three, Chapter Four of *The Klansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Four: At the Point of the Bayonet. Within an hour from Ben's encounter, he was arrested without warrant by the military commandant, handcuffed, and placed on the train for Columbia, more than a hundred miles distant the first purpose of sending him in charge of a negro guard was abandoned for fear of a riot a squad of white troops accompanied him elsie was waiting at the gate watching for his coming her heart aglow with happiness 
when marion and little hugh ran to tell the exciting news she thought it a joke and refused to believe it come dear don't tease me you know it's not true i wish i may die if it ain't so hugh solemnly declared he run gus away cause he scared aunt margaret so they come and put handcuffs on him and took him to columbia i tell you grandpa and grandma and aunt margaret are mad elsie called phil and begged him to see what had happened when phil reported ben's arrest without a warrant and the indignity to which he had been subjected on the amazing charge of resisting military authority elsie hurried with marion and hugh to the hotel to express her indignation and sent phil to columbia on the next train to fight for his release by the use of a bribe phil discovered that a special inquisition had been hastily organized to procure perjured testimony against ben on the charge of complicity in the murder of a carpet-bag adventurer named ashburn who had been killed at columbia in a row in a disreputable resort this murder had occurred the week ben cameron was in nashville the enormous reward of twenty five thousand dollars had been offered for the conviction of any man who could be implicated in the killing scores of venal wretches eager for this blood money were using every device of military tyranny to secure evidence on which to convict no matter who the man might be within six hours of his arrival they had pounced on ben they arrested as a witness an old negro named john stapler noted for his loyalty to the camerons the doctor had saved his life once in a dangerous illness they were going to put him to torture and force him to swear that ben cameron had tried to bribe him to kill ashburn general howell the commandant of the columbia district was in charleston on a visit to headquarters phil resorted to the ruse of pretending as a yankee the deepest sympathy for ashburn and by the payment of a fee of twenty dollars to the captain was admitted to the fort to witness the torture they led the old man trembling into the presence of the captain who sat on an improvised throne in full uniform have you ordered a barber to shave this man's head sternly asked the judge please marser for de lord's sake i ain't done nothing don't shave my head dat hair been robbed like dat for ten year i die show if i lose my hair bring the barber and take him back until he comes was the order in an hour they led him again into the room blindfolded and placed him in a chair have you let him see a preacher before putting him through the captain asked i have an order from the general in charleston to put him through to-day for god's sake massa don't put me through i ain't done nothing and i don't know nothing the old negro slipped to his knees trembling from head to foot the guards caught him by the shoulders and threw him back into the chair the bandage was removed and just in front of him stood a brass cannon pointed at his head a soldier beside it holding the string ready to pull john threw himself backward yelling god almighty when he scrambled to his feet and started to run another cannon swung on him from the rear he dropped to his knees and began to pray yes law i see her coming i ain't ready but lord i got to come save me shave him the captain ordered while the old man sat moaning they lathered his head with two scrubbing brushes and shaved it clean now stand him up by the wall and measure him for his coffin was the order they snatched him from the chair pushed him against the wall and measured him while they were taking his measure the man next to him whispered now it's time to save your hide tell all about ben cameron trying to hire you to kill ashburn give him a few minutes said the captain and maybe we can hear what mr cameron said about ashburn i don't know nothing general pleaded the old darky i ain't heard nothing i ain't seed mouse ben for two months you needn't lie to us the rebels have been posting you but it's no use we'll get it out of you for god master i was telling the truth put him in the dark cell and keep him there the balance of his life until he tells was the order at the end of four days phil was summoned again to witness the show john was carried to another part of the fort and shown the sweat box now tell all you know or in you go said his tormentor the negro looked at the engine of torture in abject terror a closet in the walls of the fort just big enough to admit the body with an adjustable top to press down too low for the head to be held erect the door closed tight against the breast of the victim the only air admitted was through an auger hole in the door the old man's lips moved in prayer will you tell growled the captain 
i can't tell you nothing except in a lie he moaned they thrust him in slammed the door and in a loud voice the captain said keep him there for thirty days unless he tells he was left in the agony of the sweat-box for thirty-three hours and taken out his limbs were swollen and when he attempted to walk he tottered and fell the guard jerked him to his feet and the captain said i'm afraid we've taken him out too soon but if he don't tell he can go back and finish the month out the poor old negro dropped in a faint and they carried him back to his cell phil determined to spare no means fair or foul to secure ben's release from the clutches of these devils he had as yet been unable to locate his place of confinement he continued his ruse of friendly curiosity kept in touch with the captain and the captain in touch with his pocketbook summoned to witness another interesting ceremony he hurried to the fort the officer winked at him confidentially and took him out to a row of dungeons built of logs and sealed inside with heavy boards a single pane of glass about eight inches square admitted light ten feet from the ground there was a commotion inside curses groans and cries for mercy mingling in rapid succession what is it asked phil hell's going on in there laughed the officer evidently a heavy crash as though a ton weight had struck the floor and then all was still by george it's too bad we can't see it all exclaimed the officer what does it mean urged phil again the captain laughed immoderately i've got a blue blood in there taking the blue one out of his system he gave me some impudence i'm teaching him who's running this country what are you doing to him phil asked with a sudden suspicion oh just having a little fun i put two big white drunks in there with him half fighting drunks you know and told them to work on his teeth and manicure his face a little to initiate him into the ranks of the common people so to speak again he laughed phil listening at the keyhole held up his hand hush they're talking he could hear ben cameron's voice in the softest drawl say it again please marster now both together and a little louder please marster came the united chorus now what kind of a dog did i say you are the kind that comes when his marster calls both together the underdog seems to have too much cover like his mouth might be full of cotton they repeated it louder a common stump-tailed cur dog yes sir say it a common stump-tailed cur dog marster a pair of em. no the whole thing all together we are a pair yes marster they repeated it in chorus with apologies to the dogs apologies to the dogs and why does your master honor the kennel with his presence today he hit a nigger on the head so hard he strained the nigger's ankle and he's resting from his labors that's right towser if i had you and tiggy a few hours every day i could make good squirrel dogs out of you there was a pause phil looked up and smiled what does it sound like asked the captain with a shade of doubt in his voice sounds to me like a sunday school teacher taking his class through a new catechism the captain fumbled hurriedly for his keys there's something wrong in there he opened the door and sprang in ben cameron was sitting on top of the two tufts knocking their heads together as they repeated each chorus walk in gentlemen the show is going on now the animals are doing beautifully said ben the captain muttered an oath phil suddenly grasped him by the throat hurled him against the wall and snatched the keys from his hand now open your mouth you white-livered cur and inside of twenty-four hours i'll have you behind the bars i have all the evidence i need i'm an ex-officer of the united states army of the fighting corps not the vulture division this is my friend accompany us to the street and strike your charges from the record the coward did as he was ordered and ben hurried back to piedmont with a friend toward whom he began to feel closer than a brother when elsie heard the full story of the outrage she bore herself toward ben with unusual tenderness and yet he knew that the event had driven their lives further apart he felt instinctively the cold silent eye of her father and his pride stiffened under it the girl had never considered the possibility of a marriage without her father's blessing ben cameron was too proud to ask it he began to fear that the differences between her father and his people reached to the deepest sources of life 
phil found himself a hero at the cameron house margaret said little but her bearing spoke in deeper language than words he felt it would be mean to take advantage of her gratitude but he was quick to respond to the motherly tenderness of mrs cameron in the groups of neighbors who gathered in the evenings to discuss with the doctor the hopes fears and sorrows of the people phil was a charmed listener to the most brilliant conversations he had ever heard it seemed the normal expression of their lives he had never before seen people come together to talk to one another after this fashion more and more the simplicity dignity patience courtesy and sympathy of these people in their bearing toward one another impressed him more and more he grew to like them marion went out of her way to express her open admiration for phil and tease him about margaret the rev hugh mcalpin was monopolizing her on the wednesday following his return from columbia and phil sought marion for sympathy what will you give me if i tease you about margaret right before her she asked he blushed furiously don't you dare such a thing on peril of your life you know you like to be teased about her she cried her blue eyes dancing with fun with such a pretty little friend to do all the teasing all by ourselves perhaps you'll never get her unless you have more spunk then i'll find consolation with you no i mean to marry young and your ideal of life to fill the world with flowers laughter and music especially my own home and never do a thing i could make my husband do for me how do you like it i think it is very sweet phil answered soberly at noon on the following friday the piedmont eagle appeared with an editorial signed by dr cameron denouncing in the fine language of the old school the arrest of ben as quote, despotism and the usurpation of authority end quote. at three o'clock captain gilbert in command of the troops stationed in the village marched a squad of soldiers to the newspaper office one of them carried a sledgehammer in ten minutes he demolished the office heaped the type and their splintered cases on top of the battered press in the middle of the street and set fire to the pile on the courthouse door he nailed this proclamation to the people of ulster county the censures of the press directed against the servants of the people may be endured but the military force in command of this district are not the servants of the people of south carolina we are your masters the impertinence of newspaper comment on the military will not be brooked under any circumstances whatever g c gilbert captain in command not content with this display of power he determined to make an example of dr cameron as the leader of public opinion in the county he ordered a squad of negro troops to arrest him immediately and take him to columbia for obstructing the execution of the reconstruction acts he placed the squad under command of gus whom he promoted to be a corporal with instructions to wait until the doctor was inside his house boldly enter it and arrest him when gus marched his black janissaries into the house no one was in the office margaret had gone for a ride with phil and ben had strolled with elsie to lover's leap unconscious of the excitement in town dr cameron himself had heard nothing of it having just reached home from a visit to a country patient gus stationed his men at each door and with another trooper walked straight into mrs cameron's bedroom where the doctor was resting on a lounge had an imp of perdition suddenly sprung through the floor the master of the house of cameron would not have been more enraged or surprised a sudden leap as the spring of a panther and he stood before his former slave his slender frame erect his face a livid spot in its snow-white hair his brilliant eyes flashing with fury gus suddenly lost control of his knees his old master transfixed him with his eyes and in a voice whose tone gripped him by the throat said how dare you the gun fell from the negro's hand and he dropped to the floor on his face his companion uttered a yell and sprang through the door rallying the men as he went fall back fall back he's killed gus shot him dead with his eye he's conjured him get the whole army quick they fled to the commandant gilbert ordered the negroes to their tents and led his whole company of white regulars to the hotel arrested dr cameron and rescued his fainting trooper who had been revived and placed under a tree on the lawn the little captain had a wicked look on his face 
he refused to allow the doctor a moment's delay to leave instructions for his wife who had gone to visit a neighbor he was placed in the guardhouse and a detail of twenty soldiers stationed around it the arrest was made so quickly not a dozen people in town had heard of it as fast as it was known people poured into the house one by one to express their sympathy but a greater surprise awaited them within thirty minutes after he had been placed in prison a lieutenant entered accompanied by a soldier and a negro blacksmith who carried in his hand two big chains with shackles on each end the doctor gazed at the intruders a moment with incredulity and then as the enormity of the outrage dawned on him he flushed and drew himself erect his face livid and rigid he clutched his throat with his slender fingers slowly recovered himself glanced at the shackles in the black hands and then at the young lieutenant's face and said slowly with heaving breast my god have you been sent to place these irons on me such are my orders sir replied the officer motioning to the negro smith to approach he stepped forward unlocked the padlock and prepared the fetters to be placed on his arms and legs these fetters were of enormous weight made of iron rods three-quarters of an inch thick and connected together by chains of like weight this is monstrous groaned the doctor with choking agony glancing helplessly about the bare cell for some weapon with which to defend himself suddenly looking the lieutenant in the face he said i demand sir to see your commanding officer he cannot pretend that these shackles are needed to hold a weak unarmed man in prison guarded by two hundred soldiers it is useless i have his orders direct but i must see him no such outrage has ever been recorded in the history of the american people i appeal to the magna carta rights of every man who speaks the english tongue no man shall be arrested or imprisoned or deprived of his own household or of his liberties unless by the legal judgment of his peers or by the law of the land the bayonet is your only law my orders admit of no delay for your own sake i advise you to submit as a soldier dr cameron you know i must execute orders these are not the orders of a soldier shouted the prisoner enraged beyond all control they are orders for a jailer a hangman a scullion no soldier who wears the sword of a civilized nation can take such orders the war is over the south is conquered i have no country save america for the honor of the flag for which i once poured out my blood on the heights of buena vista i protest against this shame the lieutenant fell back a moment before the burst of his anger kill me kill me he went on passionately throwing his arms wide open and exposing his breast kill i am in your power i have no desire to live under such conditions kill but you must not inflict on me and on my people this insult worse than death do your duty blacksmith said the officer turning his back and walking toward the door the negro advanced with the chains cautiously and attempted to snap one of the shackles on the doctor's right arm with sudden maniac frenzy dr cameron seized the negro by the throat hurled him to the floor and backed against the wall the lieutenant approached and remonstrated why compel me to add the indignity of personal violence you must submit i am your prisoner fiercely retorted the doctor i have been a soldier in the armies of america and i know how to die kill me and my last breath will be a blessing but while i have life to resist for myself and for my people this thing shall not be done the lieutenant called a sergeant and a file of soldiers and the sergeant stepped forward to seize the prisoner dr cameron sprang on him with the ferocity of a tiger seized his musket and attempted to wrench it from his grasp the men closed in on him a short passionate fight and the slender proud gray-haired man lay panting on the floor four powerful assailants held his hands and feet and the negro smith with a grin secured the rivet on the right ankle and turned the key in the padlock on the left as he drove the rivet into the shackle on his left arm a spurt of bruised blood from the old mexican war wound stained the iron dr cameron lay for a moment in a stupor at length he slowly rose the clank of the heavy chains seemed to choke him with horror he sank on the floor covering his face with his hands and groaned the shame oh god that i might have died my poor poor wife captain gilbert entered and said with a sneer i will take you now to see your wife and friends if you would like to call before setting out for columbia the doctor paid no attention to him 
will you follow me while i lead you through this town to show them their chief has fallen or will you force me to drag you receiving no answer he roughly drew the doctor to his feet held him by the arm and led him thus in half unconscious stupor through the principal street followed by a drove of negroes he ordered a squad of troops to meet him at the depot not a white man appeared on the streets when one saw the sight and heard the clank of those chains there was a sudden tightening of the lip a clenched fist and an averted face when they approached the hotel mrs cameron ran to meet him her face white as death in silence she kissed his lips kissed each shackle on his wrists took her handkerchief and wiped the bruised blood from the old wound on his arm the iron had opened afresh and then with a look beneath which the captain shrank she said in low tones do your work quickly you have but a few moments to get out of this town with your prisoner i have sent a friend to hold my son if he comes before you go he will kill you on sight as he would a mad dog with a sneer the captain passed the hotel and led the doctor still in half unconscious stupor toward the depot down past his old slave quarters he had given his negroes who remained faithful each a cabin and a lot they looked on in awed silence as the captain proclaimed fellow citizens you are the equal of any white man who walks the ground the white man's day is done your turn has come as he passed jake's cabin the doctor's faithful man stepped suddenly in front of him looking at the captain out of the corners of his eyes and asked is i yo equal yes dislike any white man exactly the negro's fist suddenly shot into gilbert's nose with the crack of a sledgehammer laying him stunned on the pavement then take dat from yo equal damn you he cried bending over the prostrate figure i'll show you how to treat my old marster you low-down slew-footed devil the stirring little drama roused the doctor and he turned to his servant with his old-time courtesy and said thank you jake come in here master richard i knock them things off you in a minute and i get you out of this town in a jiffy no jake that is not my way bring this gentleman some water and then my horse and buggy you can take me down to the depot this officer can follow with his men and he did end of book three chapter four Book three, chapter five of the Klansman, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter five, forty acres and a mule. When Phil returned with Margaret, he drove at Mrs. Cameron's request to find Ben, brought him with all speed to the hotel, took him to his room, and locked the door before he told him the news. After an hour's blind rage, he agreed to obey his father's positive orders to keep away from the captain until his return, and to attempt no violence against the authorities. Phil undertook to manage the case in Columbia, and spent three days collecting his evidence before leaving swifter feet had anticipated him two days after the arrival of dr cameron at the fort in columbia a dust-stained tired negro was ushered into the presence of general howell he looked about timidly and laughed loudly well my man what's the trouble you seem to have walked all the way and laugh as if you were glad of it i speck i is sir said jake sidling up confidentially well said howard good-humouredly jake's voice dropped to a whisper i hears you got my old master dr cameron in this place yes what do you know against him nothing sir i just hurry along down here to take his place so's you can send him back home he's obliged to go days a powerful lot of sick folks up there in the country can't get along without him and a powerful lot of well ones going to be raising the devil about this you could hold me sir just tell my old master when to be here and he shall come jake paused and bowed low yes sir it's just like i tell you furthermore i specs i sees the man what done the damages i spec i bust the captain's nose so tain't going to be no more good to him 
hal questioned jake as to the whole affair asked him a hundred questions about the condition of the county the position of dr cameron and the possible effect of this event on the temper of the people the affair had already given him a bad hour the news of this shackling of one of the most prominent men in the state had spread like wildfire and had caused the first deep growl of anger from the people he saw that it was a senseless piece of stupidity the election was rapidly approaching he was master of the state and the less friction the better his mind was made up instantly he released dr cameron with an apology and returned with him and jake for a personal inspection of the affairs of ulster county in a thirty minutes interview with captain gilbert howe gave him more pain than his broken nose and why did you nail up the doors of the presbyterian church he asked suavely because mcalpin the young cub who preaches there dared come to this camp and insult me about the arrest of old cameron i suppose you issued an order silencing him from the ministry i did and told him i'd shackle him if he opened his mouth again good the throne of russia needn't worry about a worthy successor any further ecclesiastical orders none except the oaths i've prescribed for them before they shall preach again fine these scotch covenanters will feel at home with you well i've made them bite the dust and they know who's running this town and don't you forget it no doubt yet we may have too much of even a good thing the league is here to run this country the business of the military is to keep still and back them when they need it we've the strongest council here to be found in any county of this section said gilbert with pride just so the league meets once a week we have promised them the land of their masters and equal social and political rights their members go armed to these meetings and drill on saturdays in the public square the white man is afraid to interfere lest his house or barn take fire a negro prisoner in the dock needs only to make the sign to be acquitted not a negro will dare to vote against us their women are formed into societies sworn to leave their husbands and refuse to marry any man who dares our anger the negro churches have pledged themselves to expel him from their membership what more do you want there's another side to it protested the captain since the league has taken in the negroes every union white man has dropped it like a hot iron except the lone scallywag or carpetbagger who expects an office in the church the social circle in business or pleasure these men are lepers how can a human being stand it i've tried to grind this hellish spirit in the dirt under my heel and unless you can do it they'll beat you in the long run you've got to have some southern white men or you're lost i'll risk it with a hundred thousand negro majority said howell with a sneer the fun will just begin then in the meantime i'll have you ease up on this county's government i've brought that man back who knocked you down let him alone i've pardoned him the less said about this affair the better as the day of the election under the new regime of reconstruction drew near the negroes were excited by rumors of the coming great events every man was to receive forty acres of land for his vote and the enthusiastic speakers and teachers had made the dream a resistless one by declaring that the government would throw in a mule with the forty acres some who had hesitated about the forty acres of land remembering that it must be worked couldn't resist the idea of owning a mule the freedmen's bureau reaped a harvest in two dollar marriage fees from negroes who were urged thus to make their children heirs of their landed estates stocked with mules every stranger who appeared in the village was regarded with awe as a possible surveyor sent from washington to run the lines of these forty acre plots and in due time the surveyors appeared uncle alec who now devoted his entire time to organizing the league and drinking whiskey which the dues he collected made easy was walking back to piedmont from a league meeting in the country dreaming of this promised land he lifted his eyes from the dusty way and saw before him two surveyors with their arms full of line stakes painted red white and blue they were well-dressed yankees he could not be mistaken not a doubt disturbed his mind the kingdom of heaven was at hand he bowed low and cried praise the lord the messengers is come i's waited long but i sees em now with my own eyes you can bet your life on that old pard said the spokesman of the pair we go two and two just as the apostles did in the olden times we have only a few left the boys are hurrying to get their homes 
all you've got to do is to drive one of these red white and blue stakes down at each corner of the forty acres of land you want and every rebel in the infernal regions can't pull it up hear dat now just like i tell you when this stake goes into the ground it's like planting a thousand cannon at each corner and will de lord's messengers come with me right now to de bend of de creek where i done pick out my forty acres we will if you have the needful for the ceremony the fee for the surveyor is small only two dollars for each stake we have no time to linger with foolish virgins who have no oil in their lamps the bridegroom has come they who have no oil must remain in outer darkness the speaker had evidently been a preacher in the north and his sacred accent sealed his authority with the old negro who had been an exhorter himself alec felt in his pocket the jingle of twenty gold dollars the initiation fees of the week's harvest of the league he drew them counted out eight and took his four stakes the surveyors kindly showed him how to drive them down firmly to the first stripe of blue when they had stepped off a square of about forty acres of the lenoir farm including the richest piece of bottom land on the creek which alex's children under his wife's direction were working for mrs lenoir and the four stakes were planted old alex shouted glory to god now said the foremost surveyor you want a deed a deed in fee simple with the big seal of the government on it and you're fixed for life the deed you can take to the courthouse and make the clerk record it the man drew from his pocket an official-looking paper with a red circular seal pasted on its face. Uncle Alec's eyes danced. Is dat de deed? It will be if I write your name on it and describe the land. And what's de fee for dat? Only twelve dollars. You can take it now or wait until we come again. There's no particular hurry about this. The wise man, though, leaves nothing for tomorrow that he can carry with him today. I takes the deed right now, Jimmin, said Alec eagerly counting out the remaining twelve dollars fix em up for me the surveyor squatted in the field and carefully wrote the document they went on their way rejoicing and old alec hurried into piedmont with the consciousness of lordship of the soil he held himself so proudly that it seemed to straighten some of the crook out of his bow legs he marched up to the hotel where margaret sat reading and marion was on the steps playing with a setter why uncle alec marion exclaimed i haven't seen you in a long time Alec drew himself to his full height, at least as full as his bow legs would permit, and said gruffly, "Miss Marion, I ask you to stop calling me uncle. My name is Mr. Alexander Lenoir." "Until Aunt Cindy gets after you," laughed the girl. "Then it's much shorter than that, Uncle Alec." He shuffled his feet and looked out at the square unconcernedly. "Yes'm, that's what fetched me here now. I comes to tell your ma to tell that woman Cindy to take her chillin off my farm." i gwine allow no more rent payin to nobody off of my land your land uncle alec when did you get it asked marion placing her cheek against the setter de government give it to me today he replied fumbling in his pocket and pulled out the document you can read it all there yourself he handed marion the paper and margaret hurried down and read it over her shoulder both girls broke into screams of laughter alec looked up sharply do you know what's written on this paper uncle alec margaret asked course i do dat's the deed to my farm of forty acres in de bend of the creek what i done struck off with de red white and blue sticks de government gimme i'll read it to you said margaret wait a minute interrupted marion i want aunt cindy to hear it she's here to see mamma in the kitchen now she ran up for alec's spouse aunt cindy walked around the house and stood by the steps eyeing her erstwhile lord with contempt got your deed is your to stop me paying my missy her rent from the land my chillin works you's her smart boy you is let's hear de deed alec edged away a little and said with a bow dar's de paper wid de big mark of de government aunt cindy sniffed the air contemptuously what is it she asked of margaret margaret read in mock solemnity the mystic writing on the deed to whom it may concern as moses lifted up the brazen serpent in the wilderness for the enlightenment of the people even so have i lifted twenty shining plunks out of this benighted nigger see la as uncle alec walked away with aunt cindy shouting in derision dar now dar now the bow in his legs seemed to have sprung a sharper curve end of book three chapter five
Book three, chapter six of the Klansman, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon, Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter six, a whisper in the crowd. The excitement which preceded the first Reconstruction election in the South paralyzed the industries of the country when demagogues poured down from the north and began their raving before crowds of ignorant negroes the plow stopped in the furrow the hoe was dropped and the millennium was at hand negro tenants working under contracts issued by the freedmen's bureau stopped work and rode their landlords mules and horses around the county following these orators the loss to the cotton crop alone from the abandonment of the growing plant was estimated at over sixty million dollars the one thing that saved the situation from despair was the large grain and forage crops of the previous season which thrifty farmers had stored in their barns so important was the barn and its precious contents that dr cameron hired jake to sleep in his this immense barn which was situated at the foot of the hill some two hundred yards behind the house had become a favorite haunt of marion and hugh she had made a pet of the beautiful thoroughbred mare which had belonged to ben during the war marion went every day to give her an apple or a lump of sugar or carry her a bunch of clover the mare would follow her about like a cat another attraction at the barn for them was becky sharp ben's setter she came to marion one morning wagging her tail seized her dress and led her into an empty stall where beneath the trough lay sleeping snugly ten little white and black spotted puppies the girl had never seen such a sight before and went into ecstasies becky wagged her tail with pride at her compliments every morning she would pull her gently into the stall just to hear her talk and laugh and pet her babies whatever election day meant to the men to marion it was one of unalloyed happiness she was to ride horseback alone and dance at her first ball ben had taught her to ride and told her she could take queen to lover's leap and back alone trembling with joy her beautiful face wreathed in smiles she led the mare to the pond in the edge of the lot and watched her drink its pure spring water when he helped her to mount in front of the hotel under her mother's gaze and saw her ride out of the gate with the exquisite lines of her little figure melting into the graceful lines of the mare's glistening form he exclaimed i declare i don't know which is the prettier marion or queen i know was the mother's soft answer they are both thoroughbreds said ben watching them admiringly wait till you see her tonight in her first ball dress whispered mrs lenoir at noon ben and phil strolled to the polling place to watch the progress of the first election under negro rule the square was jammed with shouting jostling perspiring negroes men women and children the day was warm and the african odor was supreme even in the open air a crowd of two hundred were packed around a peddler's box there were two of them one crying the wares and the other wrapping and delivering the goods they were selling a new patent poison for rats i have only a few more bottles left now gentlemen he shouted and the polls will close at sundown a great day for our brother in black two years of army rations from the freedmen's bureau with old army clothes thrown in and now the ballot the priceless glory of american citizenship but better still the very land is to be taken from these proud aristocrats and given to the poor downtrodden black man forty acres and a mule think of it provided mind you that you have a bottle of my wonder worker to kill the rats and save your corn for the mule no man can have a mule unless he has corn and no man can have corn if he has rats and only a few bottles left give me one yelled a negro forty acres and a mule your old masters to work your land and pay his rent and corn while you sit back in the shade and see him sweat give me a bottle and two of them pitchers bawled another candidate for a mule the peddler handed him the bottle and the pictures and threw a handful of his labels among the crowd these labels happened to be just the size of the ballots having on them the picture of a dead rat lying on his back 
and above the emblem of death the crossbones and skull forty acres and a mule for every black man why was i ever born white i never had no luck no how phil and ben passed on nearer the polling place around which stood a cordon of soldiers with a line of negro voters two hundred yards in length extending back into the crowd the negro leagues came in armed battalions and voted in droves carrying their muskets in their hands less than a dozen white men were to be seen about the place the negroes under the drill of the league and the freedmen's bureau protected by the bayonet were voting to enfranchise themselves disenfranchise their former masters ratify a new constitution and elect a legislature to do their will old alec was a candidate for the house chief poll holder and seemed to be in charge of the movements of the voters outside the booth as well as inside he appeared to be omnipresent and his self-importance was a sight phil had never dreamed he could not keep his eyes off him by george cameron he's a wonder he laughed alec had suppressed as far as possible the story of the painted stakes and the deed after sending out warnings to the brethren to beware of the two enticing strangers the surveyors had reaped a rich harvest and passed on alec made up his mind to go to columbia make the laws himself and never again trust a white man from the north or south the agent of the Freedmen's Bureau at Piedmont tried to choke him off the ticket. The League backed him to a man. He could neither read nor write, but before he took to whiskey, he had made a speciality of revival exhortation, and his mouth was the most effective thing about him. In this campaign, he was an orator of no mean powers. He knew what he wanted, and he knew what his people wanted, and he put the thing in words so plain that a wayfaring man, though a fool, couldn't make any mistake about it as he bustled past forming a battalion of his brethren in line to march to the polls phil followed his every movement with amused interest besides being so bow-legged that his walk was a moving joke he was so striking a negro in his personal appearance he seemed to the young northerner almost a distinct type of man his head was small and seemed mashed on the sides until it bulged into a double lobe behind even his ears which he had pierced and hung with red ear bobs seemed to have been crushed flat to the side of his head his kinked hair was wrapped in little hard rolls close to the skull and bound tightly with dirty thread his receding forehead was high and indicated a cunning intelligence his nose was broad and crushed flat against his face his jaws were strong and angular mouth wide and lips thick curling back from rows of solid teeth set obliquely in their blue gums the one perfect thing about him was the size and setting of his mouth he was a born african orator undoubtedly descended from a long line of savage spellbinders whose eloquence in the palaver houses of the jungle had made them native leaders his thin spindle shanks supported an oblong protruding stomach resembling an elderly monkey's which seemed so heavy it swayed his back to carry it the animal vivacity of his small eyes and the flexibility of his eyebrows which he worked up and down rapidly with every change of countenance expressed his eager desires he had laid aside his new shoes which hurt him and went barefoot to facilitate his movements on the great occasion his heels projected and his foot was so flat that what should have been the hollow of it made a hole in the dirt where he left his track he was already mellow with liquor and was dressed in an old army uniform and cap with two horse pistols buckled around his waist on a strap hanging from his shoulder were strung a half dozen tin canteens filled with whiskey a disturbance in the line of voters caused the young man to move forward to see what it meant two negro troopers had pulled jake out of the line and were dragging him toward old alec the election judge straightened himself up with great dignity what was de rapscallion doin in de line trying to vote fetch him before de judgment bar said alec taking a drink from one of his canteens the troopers brought jake before the judge trying to vote is your loud i would you hear about the great societies the government fomentin in this country yes i hear about em is you a member of the union league no sir i'd rather steal by myself i don't like too many in the party 
and you ain't or no calini gentleman is you you ain't a member of the red strings no sir i come when i's called they don't have to put a string on me nor her block nor her collar nor her chain nor her muzzle will you explain to this coat railed alec what coat that old army coat jake laughed in loud peals that rang over the square alec recovered his dignity and demanded angrily does you belong to the heroes of ameriky no sir i ain't burnt nobody's house nor barn yet nor hamstrung no stock nor waylaid nobody out of night honey i ain't fit to join heroes of ameriky is you a hero if you don't belong to no society said alex with judicial deliberation what is you just old-fashioned all wool in a yard wide near that stands by his old master cause he's his best friend stays at home and tends to his own business and you pay no attention to the orders i sent you to join the league no sir i ain't taking orders from a scarecrow alec ignored his insolence secure in his power you don't belong to no society what you get in that line to vote for ain't i a nigger but you ain't the right kind of nigger rest that man for a sturbin the peace they put jake in jail persuaded his wife to leave him and expelled him from the baptist church all within the week as the troopers led jake to prison a young negro apparently about fifteen years old approached alec holding in his hand one of the peddler's rat labels which had gotten well distributed among the crowd a group of negro boys followed him with these rat labels in their hands studying them intently look at this ticket uncle alec said the leader mr alexander lenoir sir is i your uncle nigger the youth walled his eyes angrily then don't you call me a nigger who's you talking to sir you can fling your sass at white folks but honey you's a projecting with death now i ain't a nigger i's a gentleman i is was the sullen answer how old is you asked alec in milder tones me mother say sixteen but the borough man says i was twenty-one yesterday the day for election is you voted today yes sir voting all the boxes cept this one look at that ticket is that the straight ticket alec who couldn't read the twelve inch letters of his favorite barroom sign took the rat label and examined it critically what ail it he asked at length the boy pointed at the picture of the rat what dat rat doin lyin there on his back with his heels cocked up in the air pear to me like a rat ought to be standin on his feet alec reexamined it carefully and then smiled benignly on the youth the ignorance of these folks what did you do without a man like me and erred with the spirit and the power to explain things you show sure got the spirits said the boy imprudently touching a canteen alec ignored the remark and looked at the rat label smilingly ain't we are votin today on the constitution what to take the ballot away from the white folks and give all the power to the colored gentlemen i ax as your dad the boy stuck his thumbs under his arms and walled his eyes yeah sir then dat mean the ratification of the constitution phil laughed followed and watched them fold their tickets get in line and vote the rat labels ben turned toward a white man with gray beard who stood watching the crowd he was a pious member of the presbyterian church but his face didn't have a pious expression today he had been refused the right to vote because he had aided the confederacy by nursing one of his wounded boys he touched his hat politely to ben what do you think of it colonel cameron he asked with a touch of scorn what's your opinion mr mcallister well colonel i've been a member of the church for over forty years i'm not a cussin man but there's a sight i never expected to live to see i've been a faithful citizen of this state for fifty years i can't vote and a nigger is to be elected today to represent me in the legislature neither you colonel nor your father are good enough to vote every nigger in this county sixteen years old and up voted today i ain't a cussin man and i don't say it as a cuss word but all i have got to say is if there be such a thing as a damn shame that's it mr mcallister the recording angel wouldn't have made a mark had you said it without the if god knows what this country's coming to 
i don't said the old man bitterly i'm afraid to let my wife and daughter go out of the house or stay in it without somebody with them ben leaned closer and whispered as phil approached come to my office tonight at ten o'clock i want to see you on some important business the old man seized his hand eagerly shall i bring my boys ben smiled no i've seen them some time ago End of Book 3, Chapter 6book three chapter seven of the clansman an historical romance of the ku klux klan by thomas dixon jr this librivox recording is in the public domain recorded by michelle fry chapter seven by the light of a torch on the night of the election mrs lenoir gave a ball at the hotel in honor of marion's entrance into society she was only in her sixteenth year yet older than her mother when mistress of her own household the only ambition the mother cherished was that she might win the love of an honest man and build for herself a beautiful home on the site of the cottage covered with trailing roses in this home dream for marion she found a great sustaining joy to which nothing in the life of man answers the ball had its political significance which the military martinet who commanded the post understood it was the way the people of piedmont expressed to him and the world their contempt for the farce of an election he had conducted and their indifference as to the result he would celebrate with many guns before midnight the young people of the town were out in force marion was a universal favorite the grace charm and tender beauty of the southern girl of sixteen were combined in her with a gentle and unselfish disposition amid poverty that was pitiful unconscious of its limitations her thoughts were always of others and she was the only human being everybody had agreed to love in the village in which she lived wealth counted for naught she belonged to the aristocracy of poetry beauty and intrinsic worth and her people knew no other as she stood in the long dining-room dressed in her first ball costume of white organdy and lace the little plump shoulders peeping through its meshes she was the picture of happiness a half-dozen boys hung on every word as the utterance of an oracle she waved gently an old ivory fan with white down on its edges in a way the charm of which is the secret birthright of every southern girl now and then she glanced at the door for some one who had not yet appeared phil paid his tribute to her with genuine feeling and marion repaid him by whispering margaret's dressed to kill all in soft azure blue her rosy cheeks black hair her eyes never shone as they do to-night she doesn't dance on account of her sunday school it's all for you phil blushed and smiled the preacher won't be here our rector will he's a nice old gentleman i'm fond of him miss marion your mother is a genius i hope she can plan these little affairs oftener it was half past ten o'clock when ben cameron entered the room with elsie a little ruffled at his delay over imaginary business at his office ben answered her criticisms with a strange elation she had felt a secret between them and resented it at mrs lenoir's special request he had put on his full uniform of a confederate colonel in honor of marion and the poem her father had written of one of his gallant charges he had not worn it since he fell that day in phil's arms no one in the room had ever seen him in this colonel's uniform its yellow sash with the gold fringe and tassels was faded and there were two bullet holes in the coat a murmur of applause from the boys sighs and exclamations from the girls swept the room as he took marion's hand bowed and kissed it her blue eyes danced and smiled on him with frank admiration ben you're the handsomest thing i've ever seen she said softly thanks i thought you had a mirror i'll send you one he answered slipping his arm around her and gliding away to the strains of a waltz the girl's hand trembled as she placed it on his shoulder her cheeks were flushed and her eyes had a wistful dreamy look in their depths when ben rejoined elsie and they strolled on the lawn the military commandant suddenly confronted them with a squad of soldiers i'll trouble you for those buttons and shoulder straps said the captain elsie's amber eyes began to spit fire ben stood still and smiled what do you mean she asked 
that i will not be insulted by the wearing of this uniform today i dare you to touch it coward poltroon cried the girl her plump little figure bristling in front of her lover ben laid his hand on her arm and gently drew her back to his side he has the power to do this it is a technical violation of law to wear them i have surrendered i am a gentleman and i have been a soldier he can have his tribute i've promised my father to offer no violence to the military authority of the united states he stepped forward and the officer cut the buttons from his coat and ripped the straps from his shoulders while the performance was going on ben quietly said general grant at appomattox with the instincts of a great soldier gave our men his spare horses and ordered that confederate officers retain their side arms the general is evidently not in touch with this force no i'm in command in this country said the captain evidently when he had gone elsie's eyes were dim they strolled under the shadow of the great oak and stood in silence listening to the music within and the distant murmur of the falls why is it sweetheart that a girl will persist in admiring brass buttons ben asked softly she raised her lips to his for a kiss and answered because a soldier's business is to die for his country as ben led her back into the ballroom and surrendered her to a friend for a dance the first gun pealed its note of victory from the square in the celebration of the triumph of the african slave over his white master ben strolled out in the street to hear the news the constitution had been ratified by an enormous majority and a legislature elected composed of one hundred and one negroes and twenty-three white men silas lynch had been elected lieutenant governor a negro secretary of state a negro treasurer and a negro justice of the supreme court when bazell a wizen-faced agent of the freedmen's bureau made this announcement from the courthouse steps pandemonium broke loose an incessant rattle of musketry began in which ball cartridges were used the missiles whistling over the town in every direction yet within half an hour the square was deserted and a strange quiet followed the storm old alec staggered by the hotel his drunkenness having reached the religious stage behold a curiosity gentlemen cried ben to a group of boys who had gathered a voter is come among us in fact he is the people the king our representative elect the honorable alexander lenoir of the county of ulster jimmins the lord's been good to me said alec weeping copiously they say the rat labels were in a majority in this precinct how was that asked ben yes yeah, dat what de scornful say dem dat sits in de seats are de scornful but de lord of hosts he fetch em low mr bizzle de bureau man count all dem rat votes right sir dey couldn't fool him he know what they mean he count em all for me and de ratification sure pop said ben if you can't ratify with a rat i'd like to know why dat's what i tells em sir of course said ben good-humouredly the voice of the people is the voice of god rats or no rats if you know how to count as old alec staggered away the sudden crash of a volley of musketry echoed in the distance what's that asked ben listening intently the sound was unmistakable to a soldier's ear the volley from a hundred rifles at a single word of command it was followed by a shot on a hill in the distance and then by a faint echo farther still ben listened a few moments and turned into the lawn of the hotel the music suddenly stopped the tramp of feet echoed on the porch a woman screamed and from the rear of the house came the cry fire fire almost at the same moment an immense sheet of flame shot skyward from the big barn my god groaned ben jake's in jail tonight and they've set the barn on fire it's worth more than the house the crowd rushed down the hill to the blazing building marion's fleet figure in its flying white dress leading the crowd the lowing of the cows and the wild neighing of the horses rang above the roar of the flames 
before ben could reach the spot marion had opened every stall two cows leaped out to safety but not a horse would move from its stall and each moment wilder and more pitiful grew their death cries marion rushed to ben her eyes dilated her face as white as the dress she wore oh ben queen won't come out what shall i do you can do nothing child a horse won't come out of a burning stable unless he's blindfolded they'll all be burned to death oh no the girl cried in agony they'd trample you to death if you tried to get them out it can't be helped it's too late as ben looked back at the gathering crowd marion suddenly snatched a horse blanket lying at the door ran with the speed of a deer to the pond plunged in sprang out and sped back to the open door of queen's stall through which her shrill cry could be heard above the others as the girl ran toward the burning building her thin white dress clinging closely to her exquisite form she looked like the marble figure of a sylph by the hand of some great master into which god had suddenly breathed the breath of life as they saw her purpose a cry of horror rose from the crowd her mother screamed loud above the rest ben rushed to catch her shouting marion 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 she'll trample you to death he was too late she leaped into the stall the crowd held their breath there was a moment of awful suspense and the mare sprang through the open door with the little white figure clinging to her mane and holding the blanket over her head a cheer rang above the roar of the flames the girl did not lose her hold until her beautiful pet was led to a place of safety while she clung to her neck and laughed and cried for joy first her mother then margaret mrs cameron and elsie took her in their arms as ben approached the group elsie whispered to him kiss her ben took her hand his eyes full of unshed tears and said the bravest deed a woman ever did you're a heroine marion before she knew it he had stooped and kissed her she was very still for a moment smiled trembled from head to foot blushed scarlet took her mother by the hand and without a word hurried to the house poor becky was whining among the excited crowd and sought in vain for marion at last she got margaret's attention caught her dress in her teeth and led her to a corner of the lot where she had laid side by side her puppies smothered to death she stood and looked at them with her tail drooping the picture of despair margaret burst into tears and called ben he bent and put his arm around the setter's neck and stroked her head with his hand looking up at his sister he said don't tell marion of this she can't stand any more tonight the crowd had all dispersed and the flames had died down for want of fuel the odor of roasting flesh pungent and acrid still lingered a sharp reminder of the tragedy ben stood on the back porch talking in low tones to his father will you join us now sir we need the name and influence of men of your standing my boy two wrongs never made a right it's better to endure a while the sober common sense of the nation will yet save us we must appeal to it eight more fires were seen from town tonight you only guess their origin i know their origin it was done by the league at a signal as a celebration of the election and a threat of terror to the country one of our men concealed a faithful negro under the floor of the schoolhouse and heard the plot hatched we expected it a month ago but hoped they had given it up even so my boy a secret society such as you have planned means a conspiracy that may bring exile or death i hate lawlessness and disorder we have had enough of it your clan means ultimately martial law at least we will get rid of these soldiers by this election they have done their worst to me but we must save others by patience it's the only way sir the next step will be a black hand on a white woman's throat the doctor frowned let us hope for the best your clan is the last act of desperation but if everything else fail and this creeping horror becomes a fact then what my boy we will pray that god may never let us live to see the day end of book three chapter seven Book Three, Chapter Eight of *The Klansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Eight: The Riot in the Master's Hall. 
alarmed at the possible growth of the secret clan into which ben had urged him to enter dr cameron determined to press for relief from oppression by an open appeal to the conscience of the nation he called a meeting of conservative leaders in a taxpayers convention at columbia his position as leader had been made supreme by the indignities he had suffered and he felt sure of his ability to accomplish results every county in the state was represented by its best men in this gathering at the capitol the day he undertook to present his memorial to the legislature was one he never forgot the streets were crowded with negroes who had come to town to hear lynch the lieutenant governor speak in a mass meeting negro policemen swung their clubs in his face as he pressed through the insolent throng up the street to the stately marble capitol at the door a black greasy trooper stopped him to parley every decently dressed white man was regarded a spy as he passed inside the doors of the house of representatives the rush of foul air staggered him the reek of vile cigars and stale whiskey mingled with the odor of perspiring negroes was overwhelming he paused and gasped for breath the space behind the seats of the members was strewn with corks broken glass stale crusts greasy pieces of paper and picked bones the hall was packed with negroes smoking chewing jabbering pushing perspiring a carpet-bagger at his elbow was explaining to an old darky from down east why his forty acres and a mule hadn't come on the other side of him a big negro bawled das all right de colored man on top the doctor surveyed the hall in dismay at first not a white member was visible the galleries were packed with negroes the speaker presiding was a negro the clerk a negro the doorkeepers negroes the little pages all coal-black negroes the chaplain a negro the negro party consisted of one hundred and one ninety-four blacks and seven scallywags who claimed to be white the remains of Aryan civilization were represented by twenty-three white men from the Scotch-Irish Hill counties. The doctor had served three terms as a member from Ulster in this hall in the old days, and its appearance now was beyond any conceivable depth of degradation. The ninety-four Africans, constituting almost its solid membership, were a motley crew. Every Negro type was there from the genteel butler to the clod hopper from the cotton and rice fields some had on second-hand seedy frock coats their old master had given them before the war glossy and threadbare old stovepipe hats of every style in vogue since noah came out of the ark were placed conspicuously on the desks or cocked on the backs of the heads of the honorable members some wore the coarse clothes of the field stained with red mud old alec he noted had a red woolen comforter wound round his neck in place of a shirt or a collar he had tried to go barefooted but the speaker had issued a rule that members should come shod he was easing his feet by placing his brogans under the desk wearing only his red socks each member had his name painted in enormous gold letters on his desk and had placed beside it a sixty dollar french imported spittoon even the congress of the united states under the inspiration of Oakes Ames and Speaker Colfax, could only afford one of domestic make, which cost a dollar. The uproar was deafening. From four to six Negroes were trying to speak at the same time. Alec's majestic mouth with blue gums and projecting teeth led the chorus as he ambled down the aisle, his bow legs flying their red sock ensigns. The speaker singled him out. His voice was something which simply could not be ignored, rapped and yelled, the gemman from ulster sat down alec turned crestfallen and resumed his seat throwing his big flat feet in their red woolens up on his desk and hiding his face behind their enormous spread he had barely settled in his chair before a new idea flashed through his head and up he jumped again mr speaker he bawled oh the dow yelled another one sat down knock him in the head sit down nigger the speaker pointed his gavel at Alec and threatened him laughingly. If the gentleman from Ulster don't sit down, I gwine call him to order. Uncle Alex greeted this threat with a wild guffaw, which the whole house about him joined in heartily. They laughed like so many hens cackling. When one started, the others would follow. 
the most of them were munching peanuts and the crush of hulls under heavy feet added a sub-note of confusion like the crackle of a prairie fire the ambition of each negro seemed to be to speak at least half dozen times on each question saying the same thing every time no man was allowed to talk five minutes without an interruption which brought on another and another until the speaker was drowned in a storm of contending yells their struggles to get the floor with bawlings bellowings and contortions and the senseless rap of the speaker's gavel were something appalling on this scene through fetid smoke and animal roar looked down from the walls in marble bas-relief the still white faces of robert hayne and george mcduffie through whose veins flowed the blood of scottish kings while over it brooded in solemn wonder the face of john lawrence whose diplomatic genius at the court of france won millions of gold for our tottering cause and sent the french fleet and army into the chesapeake to entrap cornwallis at yorktown the little group of twenty-three white men the descendants of these spirits to whom dr cameron had brought his memorial presented a pathetic spectacle most of them were old men who sat in grim silence with nothing to do or say as they watched the rising black tide their dignity reserve and decorum at once the wonder and the shame of the modern world at least they knew that the minstrel farce being enacted on the floor was a tragedy as deep and dark as was ever woven of the blood and tears of a conquered people beneath those loud guffaws they could hear the death rattle in the throat of their beloved state barbarism strangling civilization by brute force for all the stupid uproar the black leaders of this mob knew what they wanted one of them was speaking now the leader of the house the hon napoleon whipper dr cameron had taken his seat in the little group of white members in one corner of the chamber beside an old friend from an adjoining county whom he had known in better days now listen said his friend when whipper talks he always says something mr speaker i move you sir in view of the arduous duties which our presiding officer has performed this week for the state that he be allowed one thousand dollars extra pay the motion was put without debate and carried the speaker then called whipper to the chair and made the same motion to give the leader of the house an extra thousand dollars for the performance of his heavy duties it was carried what does that mean asked the doctor very simple whipper and the speaker adjourned the house yesterday afternoon to attend a horse race they lost a thousand dollars each betting on the wrong horse they are recuperating after the strain they are booked for judges of the supreme court when they finish this job the negro mass meeting tonight is to endorse their names for the supreme bench is it possible the doctor exclaimed when whipper resumed his place at his desk the introduction of bills began one after another were sent to the speaker's desk a measure to disarm the whites and equip with modern rifles a negro militia of eighty thousand men to make the uniform of confederate gray the garb of convicts in south carolina with a sign of the rank to signify the degree of crime to prevent any person calling another a nigger to require men to remove their hats in the presence of all officers civil or military and all disfranchised men to remove their hats in the presence of voters to force black and whites to attend the same schools and open the state university to negroes to permit the intermarriages of whites and blacks and to enforce social equality whipper made a brief speech on the last measure before i am through i mean that it shall be known that napoleon whipper is as good as any man in south carolina don't tell me that i'm not on equality with any man god ever made dr cameron turned pale and trembling with excitement asked his friend can that man pass such measures and the governor sign them he can pass anything he wishes the governor is his creature a dirty little scallywag who wore the union flag from fort sumter trampled it in the dust and helped raise the flag of confederacy over it now he is backed by the government at washington he won his election by dancing at negro balls and the purchase of delegates his salary as governor is thirty five hundred a year and he spends over forty thousand comment is unnecessary 
this legislature has stolen millions of dollars and already bankrupted the treasury the day howell was elected to the senate of the united states every negro on the floor had his roll of bills and some of them counted it out on their desks in your day the annual cost of the state government was four hundred thousand dollars this year it was two million these thieves steal daily they don't deny it they simply dare you to prove it the writing paper on the desks cost sixteen thousand dollars these clocks on the wall six hundred each and every little radical newspaper in the state has been subsidized with sums varying from one thousand to seven thousand dollars each member is allowed to draw for mileage per diem and sundries god only knows what the bill for sundries will aggregate by the end of the season i couldn't conceive of this exclaimed the doctor i've only given you a hint we are a conquered race the iron hand of fate is on us we can only wait for the shadows to deepen into night president grant appears to be a babe in the woods schuyler colfax the vice president and belknap the secretary of war are in the saddle in washington i hear things are happening there that are quite interesting besides congress now can give little relief the real law-making power in america is the state legislature the state lawmakers enter into the holy of holies of our daily life once more we are a sovereign state a sovereign negro state i fear my mission is futile said the doctor it's ridiculous i'll call you tonight and take you to hear lynch our lieutenant governor he is a remarkable man our negro supreme court judge will preside uncle alec who had suddenly spied dr cameron broke in with a laughing welcome i clare to goodness dr cameron i didn't know you was here sir i show sure glad to see you i axes you to come across the street to my room i got something powerful particular to say to you the doctor followed alec out of the hall and across the street to his room in a little boarding house his door was locked and the windows darkened by blinds instead of opening the blinds he lighted a lamp of course dr cameron you say nothing about what i want to tell you certainly not alec the room was full of dry goods boxes the space under the bed was packed and they were piled to the ceiling around the walls why what's all this alec the member from ulster chuckled dr cameron you's been a powerful friend to me give me medicine lots of times and i hain't never paid you nothing i's sure come into the kingdom now and i wants to pay my respects to you sir just look over dat paper and mark what you wants and i have em sent home for you the member from ulster handed his physician a printed list of more than five hundred articles of merchandise the doctor read it over with amazement i don't understand it alec do you own a store no sir but we gets all we wants from most any of em dems sundries sir dat de government gives de members we dis order what we needs no trouble at all sir de men what got de goods come round and beg us to take em the doctor smiled in spite of the tragedy back of the joke let's see some of the goods alec are they first class yes sir de best going i show you he pulled out a number of boxes and bundles exhibiting carpet doormats hassocks dog collars cowbells oilcloths velvets mosquito nets damask irish linen billiard outfits towels blankets flannels quilts women's hoods hats ribbons pins needles scissors dumbbells skates crepe skirt braids toothbrushes face powder hooks and eyes skirts bustles chignons garters artificial busts chemises parasols watches jewelry diamond earrings ivory handled knives and forks pistols and guns and a webster's dictionary got lots mo in dem boxes nailed up dar yes sir it's no use of letting good things go by you when you can just put out your hand and stop em some of the members ordered horses and carriages but i took a pair of fine mules wid harness and two buggies and a wagon day round at the livery stable sir the doctor thanked alec for his friendly feeling but told him it was of course impossible for him at this time 
being only a taxpayer and neither a voter nor a member of the legislature to share in his supply of sundries he went to the warehouse that night with his friend to hear lynch wondering if his mind were capable of receiving another shock this meeting had been called to endorse the candidacy for justice of the supreme court of napoleon whipper the leader of the house the notorious negro thief and gambler and of william pitt moses an ex-convict his confederate in crime they had been unanimously chosen for the positions by a secret caucus of the ninety-four negro members of the house this addition to the court with the negro already a member would give a majority to the black man on the last tribunal of appeal the few white men of the party who had any sense of decency were in open revolt at this atrocity but their influence was on the wane the carpet-bagger shaped the first convention and got the first plums of office now the negro was in the saddle and he meant to stay there were not enough white men in the legislature to force a roll call on a decision of the house this meeting was an open defiance of all pale-faces inside or outside party lines every inch of space in the big cotton warehouse was jammed a black living cloud pungent and piercing the distinguished lieutenant governor silas lynch had not yet arrived but the negro justice of the supreme court pinchback was in his seat as the presiding officer dr cameron watched the movements of the black judge already notorious for the sale of his opinions with a sense of sickening horror this man was but yesterday a slave his father a medicine man in an african jungle who decided the guilt or innocence of the accused by the test of administering poison if the poison killed the man he was guilty if he survived he was innocent for four thousand years his land had stood a solid bulwark of unbroken barbarism out of its darkness he had been thrust upon the seat of judgment of the laws of the proudest and highest type of man evolved in time it seemed a hideous dream his thoughts were interrupted by a shout it came spontaneous and tremendous in its genuine feeling the magnificent figure of lynch their idol appeared walking down the aisle escorted by a little scallywag who was the governor he took his seat on the platform with the easy assurance of conscious power his broad shoulders superb head and gleaming jungle eyes held every man in the audience before he had spoken a word in the first masterful tones of his voice the doctor's keen intelligence caught the ring of his savage metal and felt the shock of his powerful personality a personality which had thrown to the winds every mask whose sole aim in life was sensual whose only fears were of physical pain and death who could worship a snake and sacrifice a human being his playful introduction showed him a child of mystery moved by voices and inspired by a fetish his face was full of good humor and his whole figure rippled with sleek animal vivacity for the moment life was a comedy and a masquerade teeming with whims fancies ecstasies and superstitions he held the surging crowd in the hollow of his hand they yelled laughed howled or wept as he willed now he painted in burning words the imaginary horrors of slavery until the tears rolled down his cheeks and he wept at the sound of his own voice every dusky hearer burst into tears and moans he stopped suddenly brushed the tears from his eyes sprang to the edge of the platform threw both arms above his head and shouted hosanna to the lord god almighty for emancipation instantly five thousand negroes as one man were on their feet shouting and screaming their shouts rose in unison swelled into a thunder peal and died away as one voice dead silence followed and every eye was again riveted on lynch for two hours the doctor sat transfixed listening and watching him sway the vast audience with hypnotic power there was not one note of hesitation or of doubt it was the challenge of race against race to mortal combat his closing words again swept every negro from his seat and melted every voice into a single frenzied shout within five years he cried the intelligence and the wealth of this mighty state will be transferred to the negro race lift up your heads the world is yours take it 
here and now i serve notice on every white man who breathes that i am as good as he is i demand and i am going to have the privilege of going to see him in his house or his hotel eating with him and sleeping with him and when i see fit to take his daughter in marriage as the doctor emerged from the stifling crowd with his friend he drew a deep breath of fresh air took from his pocket his conservative memorial picked it into little bits and scattered them along the street as he walked in silence back to his hotel end of book three chapter eight Book Three, Chapter Nine of *The Klansman*, an historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan by Thomas Dixon Jr. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Michelle Fry. Chapter Nine, At Lover's Leap. In spite of the pitiful collapse of old Stoneman under his stroke of paralysis, his children still saw the unconquered soul shining in his colorless eyes. They had both been on the point of confessing their love affairs to him and joining in the inevitable struggle when he was stricken. They knew only too well that he would not consent to a dual alliance with the Camerons under the conditions of fierce hatreds and violence into which the state had drifted. They were too high-minded to consider a violation of his wishes while thus helpless, with his strange eyes following them about in childlike eagerness. His weakness was mightier than his iron will so for eighteen months while he slowly groped out of mental twilight each had waited elsie with a tender faith struggling with despair and phil in a torture of uncertainty and fear in the meantime the young northerner had become as radical as his sympathies with the southern people as his father had ever been against them this power of assimilation has always been the mark of southern genius the sight of the black hand on their throats now roused his righteous indignation the patience with which they endured was to him amazing the southerner he had found to be the last man on earth to become a revolutionist all his traits were against it his genius for command the deep sense of duty and honor his hospitality his deathless love of home his supreme constancy and sense of civic unity all combined to make him ultra conservative he began now to see that it was reverence for authority as expressed in the constitution under which slavery was expressed which made secession inevitable besides the laziness and incapacity of the negro had been more than he could endure with no ties of tradition or habits of life to bind him he simply refused to tolerate them in this feeling elsie had grown early to sympathize she discharged aunt cindy for feeding her children from the kitchen and brought a cook and house girl from the north while phil would employ only white men in any capacity in the desolation of negro rule the cameron farm had become worthless the taxes had more than absorbed the income and the place was only kept from execution by the indomitable energy of mrs cameron who made the hotel pay enough to carry the interest on a mortgage which was increasing from season to season the doctor's practice was with him a divine calling he never sent bills to his patients they paid something if they had it now they had nothing ben's law practice was large for his age and experience but his clients had no money while the camerons were growing each day poorer phil was becoming rich his genius skill and enterprise had been quick to see the possibilities of the water power the old eagle cotton mills had been burned during the war phil organized the eagle and phoenix company interested northern capitalists bought the falls and erected two great mills the dim hum of whose spindles added a new note to the river's music eager swift modest his head full of ideas his heart full of faith he had pressed forward to success as the old commoner's mind began to clear and his recovery was sure phil determined to press his suit for margaret's hand to an issue ben had dropped a hint of an interview of the rev hugh mcalpin with dr cameron which had thrown phil into a cold sweat he hurried to the hotel to ask margaret to drive with him that afternoon he would stop at lover's leap and settle the question he met the preacher just emerging from the door calm handsome serious and margaret by his side 
the dark-haired beauty seemed strangely serene what could it mean his heart was in his throat was he too late wreathed in smiles when the preacher had gone the girl's face was a riddle he could not solve to his joy she consented to go as he left in his trim little buggy for the hotel he stooped and kissed elsie whispering make an offering on the altar of love for me sis you're too slow the prayers of all the saints will not save you she replied with a laugh throwing him a kiss as he disappeared in the dust as they drove through the great forest on the cliffs overlooking the river the southern world seemed lit with new splendors today for the northerner his heart beat with a strange courage the odor of the pines their sighing music the subtone of the falls below the subtle life-giving perfume of the fullness of summer the splendor of the sun gleaming through the deep foliage and the sweet sensuous air all seemed incarnate in the calm lovely face and gracious figure beside him they took their seat on the old rustic built against the beach which was the last tree on the brink of the cliff a hundred feet below flowed the river rippling softly along a narrow strip of sand which its current had thrown against the rock the ledge of towering granite formed a cave eighty feet in depth at the water's edge from this projecting wall tradition said a young indian princess once leaped with her lover fleeing from the wrath of a cruel father who had separated them the cave below was inaccessible from above being reached by a narrow footpath along the river's edge when entered a mile downstream the view from the seat under the beach was one of marvelous beauty for miles the broad river rolled in calm shining glory seaward its banks fringed with cane and trees while fields of corn and cotton spread in waving green toward the distant hills and blue mountains of the west every tree on this cliff was cut with the initials of generations of lovers from piedmont they sat in silence for a while margaret idly playing with the flowers she had picked by the pathway and phil watching her devotedly the southern sun had tinged her face the reddish warm hue of ripened fruit doubly radiant by contrast with her wealth of dark brown hair the lustrous glance of her eyes half veiled by their long lashes and the graceful careless pose of her stately figure held him enraptured her dress of airy azure blue so becoming to her dark beauty gave phil the impression of eider-down feathers of some rare bird of the tropics he felt that if he dared to touch her she might lift her wings and sail over the cliff into the sky and forget to light again at his side i am going to ask a very bold and impertinent question miss margaret phil said with resolution may i margaret smiled incredulously i'll risk your impertinence and decide as to its boldness tell me please what that preacher said to you today margaret looked away unable to suppress the merriment that played about her eyes and mouth will you never breathe it to a soul if i do never honest injun here on the sacred altar of the princess on my honor then i'll tell you she said biting her lips to keep back a laugh mr mcalpin is very handsome and eloquent i've always thought him the best preacher we have ever had in piedmont yes i know phil interrupted with a frown he is very pious she went on evenly and seeks divine guidance in prayer in everything he does he called this morning to see me and i was playing for him in the little music room off the parlor when he suddenly closed the door and said miss margaret i am going to take this morning the most important step of my life of course i hadn't the remotest idea what he meant will you join me in a word of prayer he asked and knelt right down i was accustomed of course to kneel with him in family worship at his pastoral calls and so from habit i slipped to one knee by the piano stool wondering what on earth he was about when he prayed with fervor for the lord to bless the great love with which he hoped to hallow my life <laughs> i giggled it broke up the meeting he rose and asked me to marry him i told him the lord hadn't revealed it to me phil seized her hand and held it firmly the smile died from the girl's face her hand trembled and the rose tint on her cheeks flamed to scarlet 
margaret my own i love you he cried with joy you could have told that story only to the man whom you love is it not true yes i've loved you always said the low sweet voice always asked phil through a tear before i saw you when they told me you were as ben's twin brother my heart began to sing at the sound of your name call it he whispered phil my sweetheart she said with a laugh how tender and homelike the music of your voice the world has never seen the match of your gracious southern womanhood snowbound in the north i dreamed as a child of this world of eternal sunshine and now every memory and dream i've found in you and you won't be disappointed in my simple ideal that finds its all within a home no i love the old-fashioned dream of the south maybe you have enchanted me but i love these green hills and mountains these rivers musical with cascade and fall these solemn forests but for the black curse the south would be today the garden of the world and will you help our people lift this curse softly asked the girl nestling closer to his side yes dearest thy people shall be mine had i a thousand wrongs to cherish i'd forgive them all for your sake i'll help you build here a new south on all that's good and noble in the old until its dead fields blossom again its harbors bristle with ships and the hum of a thousand industries make music in every valley i'd sing to you in burning verse if i could but it is not my way i have been awkward and slow in love perhaps but i'll be swift in your service i dream to make dead stones and wood live and breathe for you of victories wrung from nature that are yours my poems will be deeds my flowers the hard-earned wealth that has a soul which i shall lay at your feet who said my lover was dumb she sighed with a twinkle in her shining eyes you must introduce me to your father soon he must like me as my father does you or our dream can never come true a pain gripped phil's heart but he answered bravely i will he can't help loving you they stood on the rustic seat to carve their initials within a circle high on the old beechwood book of love may i write it out in full margaret cameron philip stoneman he asked no only the initials now the full names when you've seen my father and i've seen yours jeanie campbell and henry lenoir were once written thus in full and many a lover has looked at that circle and prayed for happiness like theirs you can see there is a new one cut over the old the bark is filled and written on the fresh page is marion lenoir with the blank below for her lover's name phil looked at the freshly cut circle and laughed i wonder if marion or her mother did that her mother of course i wonder whose will be the lucky name some day within it said phil musingly as he finished his own end of book three chapter nine